Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Eli Rubin and I'm a professor of history at Western Michigan University. And I'm going to be talking today about the Industrial Revolution, a time in the 17 and 1800s of great economic and technological growth and also great political and social upheaval. We are going to be covering three main topics about the Industrial Revolution. First, the origins of the revolution. Second, the experience of those who lived through the Industrial Revolution. And finally, we're going to be talking about the impacts that the revolution had on society and on politics and on economics. So let's start at the beginning. The Industrial Revolution began in England in the 1700s. And it began because England was abundant in two very important materials, coal and water, what I like to call a steamy combination. And we'll talk about why I call it that in just a second. But it really started with a problem. So England had a lot of coal mines and the English were already quite advanced in learning to use coal as a source of fuel instead of just wood, which isn't as efficient and was what was used in most other countries at the time. And so England had a lot of coal mines. But if you've ever been to England or watched movies about England, you've probably noticed that it's almost always raining, or it seems like it's always raining or foggy in England. England is uh, abundantly, uh, uh, has an abundance of water and of rain. And so the problem uh, that was holding back the coal mining industry was that the coal mines would frequently get flooded. And with mines that deep, it was almost impossible to get the water out. Um, certainly the only means was really by uh, people carrying out with buckets. And yet oftentimes the solution to problems lies in the very problems itself. The answer here was also coal and water, but combining them in a new way that hadn't really been done before. And what I mean by that specifically had to do with a guy from Scotland originally who was named James Watt. He was an engineer who perfected an invention called the steam engine. Now, the steam engine had already been invented, um, and, and actually the principle of using steam for mechanical power um, had been known for many, many years, even back to the ancient Greeks, who noticed uh, the same thing that you've probably noticed if you've ever left the cap on a tea kettle for too long while it's heating up and the, and the cap is, uh, pops off because the steam is uh, forcing it out. And that is simply that if you burn water and you, you, or you, you boil water, um, it turns to steam and the steam can go through a pipe with great force and great power and, uh, and it can be powerful enough to move other objects or other pieces of metal. Um, and uh, the problem was twofold. One, uh, that w one of the reasons why the steam engine had never really taken off and never really been used widely for any, any practical purposes had to do with the fact that people hadn't really figured out how to how to attach it to other machines and there was no there there weren't really a lot of machines that could be used to attach to the steam engine but secondly was also the case that no one had quite figured out how to operate the steam engine efficiently enough so that it could uh, so that it wouldn't uh, dissipate all its power as the steam escaped. So how to how to keep the, the the pressure of the steam steady over time without losing its its energy. So James Watt's big contribution to this is that he figured out both of those things. Number one, he figured out a way, which we won't go into the technical details. He figured out a way to um, to to make the steam engine much more efficient so it wouldn't lose its power, but it would retain its power over a long period of time. Secondly, he realized that the problem that the coal miners were having as far as not being able to pump water out of their um, out of their flooded mines because the task was simply too hard for human muscles to accomplish, could be accomplished with his improved steam engine. 
he figured out and he made a lot of money and became very famous selling his steam engine to coal mine operators, um, which they, they attached to a pump. And then simply by burning coal in the engine, the pump started operating at a steady, forceful rate enough to pump the water out of the coal mines, thus allowing them to mine more coal and also have more water, the two things you need to make a steam engine work. And again, it's important to emphasize the Industrial Revolution happened first in England in part because England was much more plentiful in coal and in water than most other countries, including countries on, in continental Europe. But things didn't just stop there. Watt and others, once they saw how powerful this, this new realization was of a, a better functioning steam engine attached to a, a machine that otherwise would have to be operated by hand, people realized that the possibilities were limitless. Anything that was a machine of any kind that could be operated by uh, hand almost certainly could be also operated by, um, by an engine, like the steam engine. And at this very same time, another invention uh, uh, took place. Um, and this invention was called the spinning jenny. It was invented by a, a weaver and a businessman and an inventor named Samuel Hargreaves around the same time that James Watt uh, invented the steer or perfected the steam engine, Samuel Hargreaves invented the spinning jenny. And like most inventions, like the steam engine, the spinning jenny itself wasn't a brand new invention. It was built. It was built upon or as an improvement on an even earlier invention called the spinning mule. Um, basically, without going into too much detail, it's a kind of loom that you use to weave yarn together into fabric, um, and thus you have sheets of fabric that can then be sold um, wholesale um, or to, to clothes man clothing manufacturers. Um, and uh, what makes it superior to simply weaving yarn by hand or in a hand loom is that by turning this wheel with your hand, you, um, by using some gears and uh, a flywheel that you can see there, you um, make the, the loom operate much faster than, than a human hand can do um, on a traditional frame loom. So um, looking at this, it didn't take very long for um, new entrepreneurs to realize the handle on that flywheel could be easily attached to a steam engine and now you could make it run faster and longer than even a human could possibly do just by turning the wheel by hand. So again, you take one invention, the, the Watt, James Watt steam engine, and you add it to another invention, the Samuel Hargrew spinning jenny, and the result is unprecedented productive capacity, the ability to make a lot more fabric than humans had ever known how to do anywhere else in the world ever. And of course, once you have the principle established that a machine can turn the crank on, on, um, on another machine and as opposed to a human turning the wheel, there's no, no reason to, um, to stand pat with a smaller machine. So new inventions um, uh, based on the spinning jenny started to show up in the 1770s, 1780s, 1790s like this, which contain far more bobbins. Bobbins are the little spools that are the that have the, the yarn wrapped around them that get fed into the machine. And all you just need is a bigger steam engine, more coal and more water, and luckily there's plenty of that. So you just attach it to bigger and bigger and bigger machines, some of which are as big as entire two-story homes, and the bigger the machine, the more stuff it can pump out, the more it can produce, and the more money it can make for the owner of the machine. Now, as you've noticed, we've been talking about textiles, and there's a reason for that. The Industrial Revolution started with textiles, with cloth, cloth making. Um, before this time, most people wore uh, clothes that came from either wool or burlap, um, which is, uh, if you know what burlap, like a, a bag of potatoes is oftentimes out of bur made of burlap, very rough, um, very unpleasant, hot in the summer to wear. Um, 
but um, the reason why um, this took place in England, and specifically in Northern England, is because Northern England, and especially Northwestern England around the city of Manchester, was renowned for its wool production. The further north in England you get, the colder it gets, the rockier the soil gets, the hillier it gets. Um, in other words, it's not good farming uh, land. And um, so, um, but it is very wet, so there's a lot of grass growing everywhere. So it's kind of perfect for making money off of sheep, and sheep give you wool. So um, there's already a big wool industry there. So there's plenty of wool around to put into these machines. And that's one reason why it's the textile factory that really takes off. It's the first, uh, the, it's the first industry where they're, they're using the steam engine in a widespread way. Um, again, because Northern England was known for its wool production, there was another place in Europe, in central Italy, around the city of Florence, that was known for its wool production as well. But because they didn't have access to abundant coal and water, they stayed in the sort of traditional manner of weaving wool by hand. But it wasn't that much uh, earlier that cotton had been discovered as a superior material for making fabric. Cotton is sturdier. It is lighter. It uh, keeps you warm in the winter, and it keeps you cool in the summer. Cotton is originally from South Asia, from India. Um, so the British had uh, discovered it there in their colonial explorations and brought it over to the United States, uh, even before it was called the United States. And it became one of the main crops that slaves were brought to the United States from Africa to pick. Um, and the expansion of slavery in the United States um, was in large part driven by the demand for cotton in northern England. Um, once they discovered that they could get shipments of cotton from first the American colonies and then the independent United States, they found that um, it was cheaper than wool, it was superior to wool, and no one else had it. So there were people all over Europe, there were people in Russia, there were people everywhere who were dying to get their hands on some cotton fabrics. Um, shirts, dresses, pants, superior to wool in all ways. Um, and so that's what really feeds the industrial boom. It starts off with wool, but then wool is replaced by cotton and it becomes this massive, massive industry. And because it's slaves, picking the cotton. The cotton is a lot cheaper than it would have otherwise been had people been actually getting paid wages for picking cotton. There's another reason, though, that the Industrial Revolution takes off in England, especially in Northern England, when it does. Because in addition to these inventions that are very important, like the spinning jenny and the steam engine, and in addition to the advent of African slavery in North America, which, which also is important, there's another thing happening in the 1700s, which is very important. And that is called the enclosure movement. The enclosure movement is something that actually dates even further back in time to the 1600s. Before the 1600s, 1700s, in England, as in most countries in Europe and, and other parts of the world, um, most of the land that wasn't explicitly owned by somebody was considered common land. They refer to it as the commons. That would mean, you know, you'd have to imagine, you know, a small village surrounded by some, some uh, fields of grass, some prairie, some mountains, maybe some forests, some swamps. It seems strange to us today because anywhere you go in the United States, uh, the land belongs to somebody. If it's not private property, it's, um, you know, it's owned by the, the city or the county or the federal government even. But there isn't just land that's for everybody. 
even if you go to a federal national park, it's still owned by the federal government. You, you can't just build a house on there. You can't just uh, take stuff from it, right? But in England, back during this time, um, that land was considered the commons. And it was really important because the commons was how people who were of modest means, who were not rich, um, could survive. Um, you, you could, for example, graze your livestock. Even if you only owned a few cows or a few sheep, you could just walk right off into the fields and let them graze there. If you needed uh, wood to build a house um, or to repair your roof or to burn to keep yourself warm um, or to cook with, you just walked off into the forest and grabbed as much um, uh, uh, as much wood as you needed. And usually, and this actually had the beneficial effect of clearing the forests of brush um, because poor people would go into the forests and take whatever trees or branches had fallen down and take it for themselves to keep their family warm and to cook their food. And it really cut down on forest fires. It was actually quite beneficial. Um, but this all came to an end in the 1700s. The English Parliament started passing laws. The English Parliament is the government of England along with the king. And these laws were known as enclosure laws or bills of, uh, bills of uh, uh, enclosure or deeds. And they allowed wealthy people to claim the commons as their land. Um, this has been described as one of the greatest land grabs in, in history, um, at least European history. People who had connections in Parliament would get a bill passed, and it simply said, all of this land from this river to this valley belongs to you now. They didn't have to pay for it. They didn't have to acquire it. They didn't have to do anything. They simply got a bill passed, and they owned it. And what that meant was now the people who lived on that land were kicked off of the land. And um, even if they were allowed to stay, they weren't allowed to graze their sheep on it anymore. And they weren't allowed to use the forests for, for firewood, or they would have to pay rent, or they would have to pay a fee to the very wealthy person owning the land. But what it essentially meant was now all of a sudden, people who had for centuries and centuries and centuries um, lived the same lifestyle and, uh, you know, as their, as their forebears, suddenly couldn't and they had to leave their villages that there may have been in for generations. So now you have this huge mass of people who are homeless and uh, in need of work. Um, they, for the first time in their lives, they need to earn money to be able to buy food, whereas previously most of them could live by subsistence, meaning they could grow their own food and they had enough stuff just from nature all around them to make the things, the basic things that they, that they needed. Um, they had enough wood to build things that they needed them and, uh, or maybe trade some stuff for things they didn't have. But most people didn't use money. They worked for themselves um, and, um, and they didn't need money. Um, and the whole economic model changes now. Now, instead of living in a small farm where you grow everything that you need and if anything you don't have, you go off to the forest to get, now you have to get money to buy the things that you need from people who are manufacturing it and selling it to you. So where can you get money from? These are people who have never used money before. Most people hadn't used money before. So this is where we turn to the experience of what it was like to live through the Industrial Revolution. For the people who were most affected by this, ultimately everybody was, but the first people who were really wide, widely affected by this were those poorer people who were kicked off the land because of the enclosure movement and forced to look for work. And oftentimes the um, very same people who kicked them off the land um, used the, the money that they gained from owning that land to invest in buying these new machines buying the raw materials such as cotton from America, from American slaves. And they began building these very large buildings full of these machines with big steam engines. And they were called manufactories. That's a place where you manufacture things. This was shortened over time to factories. And this is where the word factory comes from. 
and oftentimes they would be clustered in big cities, starting with Manchester. And part of the reason why they were clustered in cities is that many cities were strategically located either on train lines or especially on in England on rivers or canals because the thing you need to need two things to to keep a manufactory running smoothly and um, and producing things. Number one, you need a steady supply of water and coal. So if you're located by a river, especially if you happen to be near a coal mining area, it's quite easy to um, transport the coal um, on on riverboat, um, and it's much cheaper that way than having to pay teams of horses to drag the coal. Um, in, in which much of it would spill, actually. But it's also the case that in addition to coal and water, you still need humans to operate the machines. Instead of turning the cranks and turning the wheels that operate the machines, that's what the steam engines now do. The people, their job is to make sure that the yarn is being uh, threaded into the machines, remove any jams, um, keep, you know, remove the, with the, the textiles when, when they're produced to pull them out of the machines, and if they need to go to another machine, transport them to that machine, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and, um, and where will you find people who need a job and will work in a manufactory with these machines. Cities are often the places where you will find them. And likewise, the people who are kicked off their lands will go to cities looking for these jobs. So that's why these are clustered oftentimes in cities. And now the question is, why Manchester, England? Manchester is on the western, sort of the northwestern coast of England, meaning faces the Atlantic Ocean, meaning that if you were to pack up a ship full of cotton that had been picked by slaves in, let's say, Georgia or South Carolina, um, and you wanted to sail it across the Atlantic Ocean and sell it to somebody in England, the first big port that you would reach would be Manchester. And so that's why Manchester is important, because the port right where the where the boats dock on the on the coast of the atlantic is um it's very close to manchester that's where these big ships from america from south carolina from georgia from you know from virginia are arriving full of slave picked cotton very easy one of the things you want to do in 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 manufacturing to keep your costs down is to be as close to the source of the stuff that you're using as possible the longer that stuff has to travel to get to you the more the expense is involved and thus the less profits you can make so that's why manchester is really ground zero of the industrial revolution and People with no land and no food have to come to cities like Manchester to find work. And one thing that's key here is that especially in the, in the beginning, in the early decades of this process, there were a lot more landless people than there were factories. So what that meant was that um, there was a supply and demand problem as far as labor. There were too many people who wanted a job and there weren't enough jobs. And as you probably guess, in that situation, what happens is a situation that's not good for the workers. Um, they get paid very little and they are treated very poorly and they can't do anything about it because for every one person who gets a job in one of these factories, there's four, five, six people waiting outside the gates of the factory who didn't get picked for work that day. And that means that um, the people who own these factories are able to exploit uh, or demand um, uh, work from their employees that um, would be considered excessively harsh, dangerous, long, or morally repugnant today. For example, children as young as five or six were often employed in these factories they didn't go to school they had to work because their family families would have children just to have them work to be able to save to, to have enough money for the family to live 
and um, children were prized sometimes because their smaller fingers could operate um, delicate machinery better, but also because they they could be paid less. And oftentimes, if it's a matter of simply feeding yarn into a machine, a uh, seven, eight, nine, ten year old child can be taught to do that, um, and uh, and um, and be paid even less. Um, the machines were often very dangerous with a lot of sharp gears. Um, frequently people um, got their hands caught in the gears and would have limbs ripped off. They would be maimed. There was no such thing as workers' compensation. There were no workplace safety laws. Um, if you had your arm ripped off in a, in a, in a machine like that, you uh, weren't given medical assistance. You were simply thrown out of the gates to bleed to death or go get help. Um, and then your wages for that day would be withheld to pay for the expense of cleaning your blood out of the machine. So, um, and people often worked 10, 11, 12, 13 hour days. And again, if they said they didn't want to, they'd be fired and somebody else would gladly take their place. And a sort of new conception of time emerges out of this and its relationship to work. You know, um, previously in the sort of more rural farming based um, society and economy, it's not that people didn't work and it's not that they weren't aware of time, but they were more task oriented. You know, it's sort of like, well, and if you've ever worked on a farm, you kind of know this. You have to get, you know, these these straw bales, you know, put away in the barn or you need to, you know, harvest this part of the field um, before it gets too cold, right? And if you finish early, you've got plenty of time to enjoy the fruits of your labor. Or you could do something else with your time. It doesn't really matter. But the main thing is just getting that crop done. Here, there's no obvious end to the job. There's The job never stops. The machines never stop. Um, the only thing that matters is getting the most out of the workers. So if you own a factory and the cotton is coming in, so you buy the cotton from the ships that come in, and you buy the coal, you might even have to go into debt, um, borrow money to buy all that. It's a big expense to start with. You bring it to the manufactory, and then you have your workers. Now, if your workers can only produce, let's say, 100 uh, uh, pounds of fabric in a day, when you sell those 100 pounds, and you only get back enough to break even, that's not good business. But if your workers could be made to produce 200 pounds of fabric in a day, now you're well above breaking even and you can keep some of the profits. The trick is how do you get the workers to produce more in the same period of time? And people quickly realize that's the secret to the whole game. That is, that is the whole enchilada. In, in one day's work time, in 24 hours of operations at a factory, you have got to get your workers to work hard the whole time. So things like bathroom breaks or lunch breaks are very, very, very uh, strictly curtailed. Five minutes twice a day um, for bathroom, 10 minutes for lunch, nothing else. Because Every second, every minute, every 10 minutes that a worker is idle while they're being paid is cutting into your profits. And this may seem obvious to you now, but nobody had really thought in these terms until the late 1700s, early 1800s, the time period we're discussing. And then another part of the experience uh, is the, the, the pollution that burning the coal um, uh, uh, spewed all over these cities. The famous poet William Blake referred to them, uh, these manufactories, as dark satanic mills because they, um, they covered uh, cities in clouds of black smoke. There were no environmental quality laws or, or air quality laws back then. And then another thing that develops in these cities, whenever you, you have a migration of large numbers of people coming into cities desperately poor, starving, 
and basically being taken advantage of because of their weakened state, you have people who are essentially working just to make enough to make it to the next day and um, with very little left over for building a nice house, for example. Um, so you have the development of slums. There had been something like slums going back to the Middle Ages and even earlier, but nothing on this scale before. Um, entire cities, almost the entire eastern half of London was looked like this, was a huge slum of desperately poor people living in terrible living conditions because they, they couldn't afford anything else. Um, the conditions were very dirty, very crowded, unsanitary, dangerous, high crime, and of course breathing in black smoke from the factory chimneys all the time. Um, and those were the people who were fortunate. The ones who couldn't get work couldn't even live in a slum. They slept on the streets with their families, and this was known as sleeping rough. And so soon the, the, the possibility of making money in this way, once people saw how it could work in England, um, spread to continental Europe, especially France and Germany and Belgium and Holland, um, and then it spread to North America. In Germany, it was especially intense because Germany is one of the other places that has large coal deposits and a lot of water um, available. Um, Germany has a valley in its western part called the Ruhr, which is has the biggest coal deposits in Europe, actually. And so you had the same problems in Germany, but even worse than in England. Um, people were crammed together in these uh, tightly packed slum apartments that they referred to as rental barracks because it was like living in the army. Um, and the common saying among the, uh, the workers in Germany was the rent eats everything. 60-70% of people's um, money went to paying rent. So it was awful for a lot of the people, but obviously it was very good for some people. And who were the people who benefited? Well, um, we, use, we started using a term um, that is sometimes used um, today as well called the bourgeoisie. And the bourgeoisie were the winners of the Industrial Revolution. These were the people um, and their families and their, and their associates who owned the factories and who owned the machines or who invested in, in the factories and the machines. And um, they were what we sometimes call new money. And they very quickly surpassed what we call old money, the old established aristocracy, the noble men noble women, people who owned castles, but they didn't own factories, and castles don't make money the way that factories do. So very quickly they began taking on the habits of the aristocracy, having fancy uh, fancy dresses and, and fancy um, dinners and things like that. And then of course you have another uh, class of people who were referred to, and still are to this day, sometimes referred to as the proletariat. It's the large class of people who have to work for wages um, and uh, who don't get to keep the, the materials that they produce, which are sold, and the profits go to the owners of the factories. Um, and so this is one of the first real impacts that we see developing from the Industrial Revolution, um, this development of this huge working class who are barely hanging on by a thread. And so for the first time in the early 1800s, you start to see the development of labor unions, which were considered illegal, and uh, the police uh, tried to destroy them wherever they popped up. But um, oftentimes, whether they were made illegal or not, workers discovered the power of the strike. And um, even in situations where there were other workers waiting to take their place, they developed methods to stop those workers from taking their place. And thus, labor unions were born. And from there, again, in England and then spreading to other countries, the um, very large political movement started to develop to reform not just the economy to make it fairer for people who work in factories, but um, to reform all of politics and all of society to make it a fairer society. One of the biggest movements that took place in the 1830s and 40s and 50s was known as Chartism which sought not just to make life better for workers, but to make uh, the democracy in England more fair. Until then, 
only men who owned property could vote. And um, oftentimes that just reinforced in Parliament the view of the people who owned everything, as opposed to the majority of the people who didn't own any land at all. There was a smaller movement known as Luddism, or the Luddites, and these were people who saw the machines themselves as the problem, and they would go and smash the machines and destroy them. They were usually caught and put to death. Um, and then you had a whole group of people who thought it was time to completely reimagine society and started developing entirely new models for how people could live. They were called utopians. Um, and one other really big impact before we return to the utopians was the growth of colonialism and imperialism. Um, and that's because, just like with cotton, most of the things that they needed to feed into these factories were not found in Europe. That included cotton, but also included, for example, rubber, which uh, for a time was only found in South America and in Africa, in the Congo. And then myriad other minerals like phosphorus, which you need to make all kinds of important chemical products, are usually not found in, in Europe. Um, and so much of the growth of colonies throughout Africa and Asia and South America were really about a search for um, raw materials for the Industrial Revolution. And then another thing that drives the colonialism, especially of England and also France and other countries, is that if they had some other place where they could settle this landless working class, it, things might not be so miserable and there might not be so many so much upheaval. And so a lot of the settlers who come to North America, whether it's the United States or Canada, or go to Australia or New Zealand or South Africa, these are um, people who simply couldn't find work and were starving and living a terrible life because of the Industrial Revolution, having been kicked off their land originally in, in England. But the last thing that we're going to turn to is another impact that grows out of the both the, um, the union movement and the strike movement, but also the utopian movement, and that is socialism and communism, both of which are direct responses to the Industrial Revolution. And in particular, communism, which had existed as, as a, as a loose, loosely defined idea, was uh, nailed down and given a lot more detail and a lot more, um, uh, a, a lot more cohesiveness by a German philosopher who moved to England named Karl Marx, um, commonly considered the founder of the modern communist movement. And Marx believed that um, the huge upheavals that we've been talking about were a phase of history that were not was not going to last forever, but was actually necessary for um, for history to pass through. And yet, he believed that ultimately the problems caused by industrialization, the slums, the colonialism, and the pollution, would eventually outweigh the benefits. The many would take revenge on the few, and it would be a giant revolution. Um, followed by a period of communism, which he foresaw as um, a time of harmony in which there was no more government, no more need for money, in which people had all the resources they needed to be happy in life and to fulfill their dreams. Um, and he pushed this forward in London, um, which you know was the heart of the Industrial Revolution, was also the heart of the, the early communist movement, with what he called the International Working Man's Association, which was supposed to fight for all the working class, not just in England, but in all countries. And this becomes known as the First International, which morphs eventually after Marx's death in the, 18, um, in the 1880s into the worldwide communist movement, which then takes many different forms in some countries versus others. In Russia, obviously, it leads to a revolution which creates the Soviet Union. But in England, for example, and in the United States, um, and in France and some other countries, it doesn't lead to communism. It instead um, pushes uh, governments to pass reforms, such as child labor laws, which outlaw child labor which grant formal legal rights to unions, um, no longer allowing them to be made illegal or attacked. And eventually, by the dawn of the 20th century, and especially after 
World War II, it culminates in the creation of social safety nets, things that we're used to as Social Security or Medicare um, that the British have as the National Health System or the National Health Service, um, which is a um, guaranteed health care for everybody, or even something like public schools that are guaranteed um, for people and that are free. Those are all results of reforms that people wanted to put in place to fix the bad outcomes, the bad impacts of the Industrial Revolution, and also to steal some of the, the, the thunder, as it were, of the more radical groups um, coming out of of the Industrial Revolution, such as the Communists. And that concludes our lecture today on the Industrial Revolution and its impacts. Thank you very much.